Could you please give us your name and your job title? I am Mr. Vasudevan. Uh, I'm currently the editorial manager at the Papare.com in Sri Lanka. Now, I have been purposely uh, trying to ignore everything that went on with the suspensions of the Sri Lankan players over the bubble because I figured that on many different levels this is a story that would annoy me. But for people like me who just kind of didn't follow it, can you just take me through what actually happened? Okay, so basically, um, Sri Lanka, I think this is the key part, is that Sri Lanka was struggling in England and have been struggling during this year. Um, and then a fan, or a Sri Lankan fan, uh, put out a video of Danish Kibunatilaka Kusa Mendes and Niroshan Dikwela out on the streets of uh, Durham uh, around, I think, uh, 11.30 uh, after a game. Um, so that video went viral in Sri Lanka, uh, particularly because of uh, uh, how Kusal Mendes and <laughs> Dikwela looked in the video. I think that they looked very, they looked like they were doing something dodgy. Um, it, well, in, in, in Hollywood terms, they always call that as tired and emotional, don't they? They look <laughs> extremely tired and very <laughs> emotional. Yeah, I don't know what you would call it, but there are a lot of, um, it, re- it went everywhere. Uh, I mean, Gurudilaka was not in the initial video, uh, but then, uh, of course, they later found out that the three, the three of them had gone beyond uh, the area where they were allowed to by Sri Lanka cricket. So, of course, they were pulled out of the tour, brought back to Sri Lanka, and um, the whole incident was investigated. Uh, the committee that was appointed to investigate it rec- recommended a two-year ban for Gunatilaka and Mendes and an 18-month ban for uh, Dikwell, plus a, a $25,000 uh, fine, I think, per, per player. Um, but uh, Sri Lanka cricket then um, did, didn't, uh, I mean, they didn't accept or they didn't follow the recommendation, uh, but did give all three of them a year long ban from international cricket. They'll also be banned for six months from um, domestic cricket and be fined double the amount. So, uh, I mean, that's that's a very, very long suspension. I'm not yeah. saying that they, I mean, I understand the reason behind it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you if you spend all of your um, time convincing England uh, to allow you to come over and England spend all that money on their bio uh, bubble and making everything secure, and then your three players are just caught yeah. completely uh, doing that. that, that causes big problems politically for Sri Lanka going mm-hmm. ahead. Mm-hmm. That still seems like a fairly big ban to me. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think if it's simply the breach of the bio bubble, it's, it seems really harsh. Particularly, I would say for Niroshan Dikpala, because he does the other two. Uh, Danushka Gunatilaka has served two suspensions previously in 2017 and 2018. Um, uh, Kusal Mendes was also involved in an incident last year where he didn't really face any sanctions from Sri Lanka cricket, but uh, it, it was a major incident, um, but Dickfella doesn't have anything on record. But he's also been handed the same uh, type of ban uh, as the other three. So I think uh, he would particularly feel, uh, you know, hard done by by the administration. And I also think it's important for us to uh, kind of put things into perspective. If Sri Lanka were doing well. I doubt that, uh, you know, there would have been such a harsh punishment handed out to them. I, I, and Sri Lanka is not doing well. You mm. are not just on this podcast to explain that particular incident. You are on this podcast to explain all the many different ways that Sri Lanka is not going well. I want to focus on the coaches because I've had friends who have been very close to getting coaching jobs or yeah. have been in the final list or have been um, contacted about going to coach in Sri Lanka. And they quite often get in touch with me and say, you know, well, what do you know? Well, I hear some bad things. I'm like, it's, it's bad. It's, mm-hmm. it's a very bad situation. See if I've got all this right. I reckon I'm missing one. And I'm not sure how far back I'm going. Graham Ford, Paul Farbrace for like a millisecond. I'm not even sure he even ended up taking the job. Um, Hathra Singer, 
who came over from Bangladesh. If I if I'm not mistaken, Nick Pothas was yep. coach of South uh, Sri Lanka for a little while, and now Mickey Arthur. Am I missing any names? And how far? What's what's that? Is that about five years? Four years? Yeah, six yeah. years. Uh, it, this is since about 2014, I think. So Fabrice was in charge of the team when they won the world, the T20 World Cup. Since then, uh, it's been Graham Ford, Portis, um, uh, and Hathur Singh, and now Mickey Arthur. That that seems to me like a lot of coaches. Could you take me through why it's been so many coaches? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Hathur Singh and uh, Graham Ford were pursued. They were, we practically, I think, I think Puma Sangakara was involved in getting uh, Graham Ford down uh, to Sri Lanka. He he had coached the team previously as well with some success, so he was instrumental in bringing him down here. But once he started uh, his work here, they brought down uh, Asanka Guru Singh her, and his role as cricket manager kind of overlapped uh, or uh, Ford's role. So I, I think that was one of the key areas that Ford was unhappy with because um, he he didn't feel like he was getting what he what he needed to uh, for the team to progress. Hathra Singh was also pursued and I think hailed as like the messiah of Sri Lanka cricket with him. Uh, we know Sri Lanka is Well, he coached, he coached Sydney Thunder and mm-hmm. Bangladesh, hadn't he? So yeah. uh, for a Sri Lankan coach, that's really good experience, yes, yeah. isn't it? You know, you know he'd, he'd been involved and, and everything. So you could see why they were desperate to get him involved, uh, but then not so desperate to keep him. <laughs> yeah, I think to my eyes, what I see is when when you hire a coach, uh, obviously he comes with his own plans for the team. But what Sri Lanka cricket have a problem with is accepting that even with Mickey Arthur, I, I can see so many, uh, you know, critics uh, uh, cri- uh, critics talking about his fitness policy. That's what brought him success with Pakistan. And that is why he was hired. So similar problems came up with Hathra Singh as well. Hathra Singh also had uh, issues, I think, um, with some of the senior players, and then his his he was also not allowed to do things the way he wanted to. Graham Ford was the same, so I think that's like a running theme where they bring them down to do a certain thing, but they don't allow them to go about their business to get that done. Yeah, and I think that without uh, putting the daggers into Mickey Arthur, uh, there's a very big chance that there will be another move when it comes to um, coaches. Uh, captains. Um, I had to copy this from um, uh, Fidel Fernando's uh, ESPN piece because uh, there were so many, I couldn't remember them all. This is ODI captains. Yeah. So in the middle of 2017, Angelo Matthew um, uh, gave the position to Upal Taranga. Yeah. yeah. Right? That that went to Tisara Pereira later that year. <laughs> Then it went back to Matthews after that. Um, in late 2018, Dinesh Chandamal took over from Matthews. In early 2019, I can't believe I've forgotten this one, but Lassif Malinga suddenly was the captain. Yeah. Um, then the test playing Dimas Karunaratna was given the captaincy just before the World Cup. Then Kusul Pereira got it in 2019. And I've got, obviously now that has changed again. And um, Dustin Shunaka is now the, he yeah. is the captain, isn't he? Yes, he yeah. is, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. God, yeah. There's so many names there. That is, that's like less than four years. And I feel like I've named every Sri Lankan male. Yeah, it does seem like uh, they've gone through, or they're trying to go through every, you know, guy who's played more than a tw- more than 20 games. So, a uh, bit... Uh, Weirdly enough, Dimut Karunaratna is probably the most has was probably the most successful out of them all in terms of captaincy because I think it, he was a last minute appointment um, for the 2019 World Cup. He hadn't played ODI cricket in a number of years, um, but he was able to kind of bring together all the different uh, uh, you know factions within the team um, and do well, and then. Uh, 
Gonzalo Pereira then was appointed captain with the, the selection committee, kind of deciding that they want to take a youth first kind of modern day cricket or ODI cricket route and leave the Karnaratna out of the team. And now Kusat Pereira lasted, I think, one series, just the in- tour of England. Now he's gone. Uh, Dasun Shanika is in. But I think, I know Sri Lanka beat like, a, I won't say B team, but, uh, 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 you know. It was I a B mean, team. <laughs> an Indian team <laughs> lacking pretty much half of their, uh, you know, most experienced players. But Shanika is someone who has previously, uh, you know, shown some leadership capabilities. Uh, he t- he took a very, very young team to Pakistan in 2019 and uh, swept the T20 series there, where I think Pakistan ranked number one at that time. Uh, so that was a, like a pretty con- uh, significant achievement on his part. And he's also shown some, you know, positive signs during the LPL when he captained one of the uh, franchises. So there is something there, but of course, you know, you can't keep, you know, ex- you change a captain every series and expect uh, there to be results because that's what seems to be happening. When they appointed Kusal Pereira, they appointed him saying um, he's he's a guy who is sure of his place in the team. That was the reasoning. Uh, or that's what was, uh, you know, told. Um, so... On that basis, it's very difficult, I think, to keep uh, keep the captaincy because uh, the way Sri Lanka has been performing barring this series has been pretty bad. So I don't know if anyone, apart from Manindu Hasarongo and Dushmanta Chamita, are sure of their place in the team. Um, so let's focus on the latest captain, um, mm-hmm. Shanaka, there, that, that you've mentioned. There's also a political thing that's going on with with him and the captaincy um I, I again this is one of those ones where i was like i can't i cover a lot of cricket estelle as you know mm-hmm. and i basically wait for teams to get look like they're going to be really good or start to be really good or are about to decline or are really terrible with Sri Lanka, i've just been like they've been so bad for so long there's a certain point where i'm just like that the, the narrative hasn't changed so I don't want to delve into each individual nightmare <laughs> as it comes up. But from what I understand, he was offered the the captaincy, and at least in part, and this may not be this may not even be true, but it is thought that at least uh, that is because the players were not signing their contracts, and he was given like a deal to be captain because he was willing to sign his contract which makes him almost like a strike breaker, but not quite a strike breaker. <laughs> but either way, there's a political side to all this. Would it, Do you think any of that played a part in him becoming a captain? Yeah, it's very hard to say. I also heard this. It was kind of a rumor that floated around um, that he had been offered something uh, in exchange for uh, you know signing the contract. But I guess... Uh, it's difficult to tell at the moment, but now that, you know, he's had success, like I said, it doesn't matter to any of them that this was not a full-strength India team. Uh, now that he's had success, uh, you know, he'll be able to play that down. Uh, even if it was true, he'd be able to play that down. That makes sense. I, I like that. He, he just Let's just pretend that all didn't happen <laughs> and uh, and it's fine. Let's just move on. Um, but the contracts is very important. So a lot of the underlying pressure between the players and Sri Lankan cricket come from the, the men's contracts. Can you explain what the standoff kind of was between those two things? Yeah, so they announced the uh, you know newly formulated contracts where the players of course graded A1, A2, A3, A- etc. And uh, one of the biggest problems, according to my understanding, for the players was that they wanted to know how they were graded. Because according to these contracts offered, uh, Miroshan Dikwala and Dananjay De Silva were A1 tier. And it, the captain at the time, test captain at the time, Dimit Karnarath, and Waifa, I think the, the most successful test player we've had over the last few years, uh, he was uh, he's in A3. With Angelo Matthews and Kusal Pereira in A2. So I think 
it, most most people, I think most fans also had a problem with how is, how do they justify Niroshan Dikpal and Ananjay De Silva being about guys who are captaining the team and who have performed significantly well over the past um, a couple of years. So that was the main issue. Plus, well, Karuna Ratney, when was Karuna Ratney in the World Test 11? Was it last year? Uh, he or was the in before? the like, uh, World Test Championship. Uh, I think he was in the 11 that the, that the ICC picked. For the World Test. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. no, one, Dick Weller isn't getting in that, in that <laughs> squad, is he? And the fact that he's in Tier 3 mm-hmm. and Dick Weller's in Tier 1. Yeah. And I know Dick Weller is maybe more of an all-format player going yeah. forward, but you yeah. can certainly understand why... Every single person was like, well, how is this actually done? Uh, it seems like that was a mistake. So that's that's part of the problem. Uh, and, and there was also, was there not also a problem with, um, uh, the players kept saying that there was a problem with the way the domestic structure was being uh, was going ahead. So for those who don't know, there are 24 first-class teams in, in Sri Lanka. Like, but basically, every eight square inches of Sri Lanka has a first-class cricket team at this point. And that, that the players have also been a bit upset at that. They think that they can't get better because that domestic cricket is so weak in in Sri Lanka. Yeah, I think that's been something that has been a problem for many years, not just in the past five years where we've done really badly. Um, but the thinking still is, okay, we achieved this much success. We, we were T20 world champions. In 2014, we were world champions in 1996. We came into this number of finals with this system. So why do we need to change it? I think that is the attitude um, of Sri Lanka cricket on the matter. So for players also, it's hard because, uh, as you know, you if you don't play competitive cricket and you don't have the best players coming up against each other all the time consistently, it's very difficult for them to develop into better players. I think uh, uh, I, I recall a couple of years ago, even someone like Vimut Kaurnaratna talking about how Sri Lankan spinners, uh, they're used to taking five wickets in five overs in domestic cricket. So when they come into test cricket, they, they don't know how to you know, bowl 15 overs to a plan and try to work a batsman out. That's something they have to learn at international cricket. So that that is a major problem, I think, that uh, Sri Lanka cricket seems not to be accepting is an issue. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm saying that something brought you success in 1996 and uh, basically ignoring everything that has happened since then other than your one other win sort of does suggest that uh, there are bigger problems going on than uh, the contracts and uh, a couple of players out on the piss in Durham. Uh, although. Mm-hmm. Those, those are not great either. We talked about the men. It was, what, around 2012, 2013, when the Sri Lankan women sort of, I don't know what to say, exploded onto the scene, but they beat the Indian women, they beat the English women. It was huge upset, and obviously they've, they've produced a couple of incredibly talented players. How have they been doing in the last uh, year and a half, Estelle? Well, uh they haven't played any international cricket. And apart from Chamari Atapattu and Shashikula Siriwaddhanam who were invited to play the women's uh, T20 challenge, the others have played one domestic tournament. Eight teams played seven matches each. That is it. For the last, Since uh, the last match they played in the T20 World Cup, March 2020, um, no cricket. They have uh, had one domestic tournament. That's it. There's there's supposed to be a major women's tournament coming up, uh, a World Cup of some sort. So we would expect the Sri Lankan women to do really well there with their lack of practice and their lack of domestic games. Yeah, first they have to qualify. So uh, they've, got, they've got the qualifiers, I think, in December. Uh, Sri Lanka will probably host the qualifiers. Where they will, uh, uh, they'll have to battle it out with West Indies, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Ireland, uh, Thailand, who have beaten them before, um, Papua New Guinea, uh, the Netherlands. So those teams, those nine teams will be competing for three spots in the World Cup. Um, so it's, you know, it's very difficult 
to say, I think Sri Lanka will probably be fighting for the third spot because West Indies and Pakistan are likely, you know, barring any upsets to go through. But that last spot will be the one that they will have to, you know, fight for. All right, so no good news there. So let's move on from the women because that sounds even worse. Um, so, so one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a lot is that Sri Lankan cricket is basically the only sort of major cricket um, team that do doesn't, or for the longest time, did not have a major T20 domestic competition. So there was the, the Sri Lankan Premier League, which was absolutely doomed from the start, um, which sold its rights to a company uh, for TV that didn't even exist, as far as I could tell at the time. Uh, that league completely folded. From there, up until now, the, with the Lankan Premier League, uh, which just took the Shri off, that's all that's changed. But uh, until then, basically, most of the domestic T20 cricket has been of quite a poor quality, short tournaments, uh, not a lot of money involved, not many overseas players involved, and, and all those sorts of things. So I, it, it's, it's very hard in modern cricket to be able to make money other than playing international cricket if you don't have another league that is making money it means your players aren't getting experience it means overseas players and coaches aren't coming into the system and it means your cricket board isn't making as much money it seems like an absolute tr you know a trifecta of madness from Sri Lanka cricket to allow that to happen for so long why did it take so long to get to another professional t20 league from what i can tell mostly it's just that no one was interested in investing in it I think uh, one of the major reasons is probably how the, is the Sri Lanka Premier League went back, uh, how it went, like you explained, you know, it was, uh, you know, not the most uh, clean looking thing uh, Sri Lanka has produced. So I think that was, that is the major reason that, <laughs> uh, you know, that clean has looking not thing is such a, that's such a, a <laughs> Clean looking thing is such a polite way of putting it. It was it was a it was a ginormous clusterfuck, wasn't it, from beginning to end. But so so no one's interested in it. But within Sri Lankan cricket, Sri Lankan cricket has a board. Uh, they have government support. Too much government support, you might say, government interference at times. There is money within Sri Lankan cricket that, you know, I, I know it's not the richest country, uh, but there is if you're ever going to get funding for anything, it's going to be cricket. Plus, you know, there's quite a few series that are played by Sh Sri Lanka are still playing a lot of cricket. Um, I, I looked up the numbers the other day. I was shocked at the fact that they're still playing such a high volume of cricket. There has to be something at that point sort of within the system that is not working. There's something within Sri Lankan cricket that is not working when you look at the governance. Yeah, and I think, again, it's something that has been addressed many, many times. And, you know, every sports minister, every Sri Lanka cricket president who comes around promises changes, but those changes don't happen ultimately. So, uh, you know, the longer it takes, the more far behind Sri Lanka falls. And you can see it now, you know, when you, when you compare teams, that England series was just, it made things obvious what what a massive gap between the two teams there is with against India. Fortunately, we didn't have to face uh, the top team, but you know it it it's clear all those things. The longer they take to change things at the root where there is a problem, like for example the domestic teams, the number of domestic teams, the bigger that gap's going to get. And um, I think everyone. In administration, they have their own agendas. Um, so I don't see anyone who really thinks that they need to change it within that system. So that's why things are still the same. They're the same. It's the same people who've been there for basically the last five years, 10 years. I just want to quickly focus on a couple of positives that have, that have happened. Uh, the the T20 League, actually, the new one, the Lanka Premier League, was a success considering it was played during COVID times and everything. I, I think I, I think it looked like a very good thing for Sri Lankan cricket. Am I misreading that or is that how you read it? No, I think it was a very good thing. It gave a lot of uh, younger players the opportunity to, you know, work, although 
Sri Lanka was not able to draw some of the biggest names in T20 cricket, uh, global T20 cricket. There were some, you know, good good players that came over, guys like Andre Russell. I think a lot of young players would have learned a lot from uh, cricketers like that. And it's really about experience playing in those high octane situations, right? Uh, which Sri Lanka doesn't get in 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 the domestic arena. So I think it was a it was a massive positive for a lot of players, um, but uh, profit wise, I don't think there was any profit of the first edition. Uh, but if it continues, I think we should see at least a few you know names coming out of that. Uh, guys like Hasaranga, for example, was man of the series, um, performed really well, and he's continued that form uh, through international cricket as well. Yeah, I mean, most T20 leagues are not successful financially in the first year. So I'm not too worried about that as, as something that's happened. The, the other positive is uh, that Tom Moody has come back. He's now in the director of cricket role for um, Sri Lankan cricket. Obviously, he has worked with Sri Lankan cricket before. Um, loves Must love the country because he keeps taking jobs there, despite everything we have just said. And... Uh, that seems like a positive as well, because that, again, looks like he is trying to fix the structural problems of the game. Yeah, I think that was a massive appointment, a really valuable one for Sri Lanka cricket. And unfortunately, like the one of the first things he did hasn't gone down too well, the contracts. I think uh, he, he was a big part of the team that formulated the contracts. But yeah, Tom Moody has experience, he's worked in Sri Lanka before, he's had a lot of success. He's, I think, someone a lot of the players will also respect. Um, so it's a, it's a massive appointment, but again, like I mentioned with the coaches, it's also about, it's not just about hiring the guy, you've got, you've got to let him do what he's there to do. If there's interference, then it does, ultimately it doesn't work. So, Let's go to the giant elephant in the room then. Millions of coaches, millions of captains. Uh, you, the women are not even playing anymore. You've, the men's team has just gone. I mean, I've got them. I, I, I think they're, if I was betting on who's going to come last in the World Test Championship, I'd probably put my money on Sri Lanka right at the moment, um, even though I'm not sure Bangladesh are going to try that hard. You've got five, you know, years of being in the wilderness when it comes to T20 cricket because you haven't had a league. Despite the fact that I think over the last five or six years there's been plenty of T20 talent that have gone that's gone through um, uh, Sri Lanka. I think Dan and Jay De Silva, if he'd come from another country, would have probably been a much wanted T T20 player on the franchise circuit. But instead, he barely plays because he never even gets to play in a good league at home. Essentially, and then you've got Sri Lankan cricket. So Ashley De Silva has been the CEO for 10 years. So some of that was successful at the start. A lot of that has not been successful. And it doesn't feel like anything is massively about to change. Sri Lanka cricket, uh, currently the former, the, the, well, the, the, the board system is not, uh, it doesn't make any sense. There's about 4,000 cricket clubs who seem to vote on who um, ends up at Sri Lankan cricket at any one time, which means that Everything is political, whichever it means that you know you have a bunch of smaller situations that don't really follow, and then you've got the, you've still got the basic problem of the government interference. So, um, uh, former President Rajapaksa's son is uh, the sports minister. That they are known for you know being involved with everything that they want to be involved with. So, even though we've said that there's a couple of positives there, there's the youth movement of 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 the limited overs cricket. There's uh, Tom Moody, and there's the new T20 league fundamentally, it's going to be very hard to be, for there to be any great changes coming through when the, at, the actual organization who runs it is the organization who previously ran it into the ground. Nothing has been changed to fix Sri Lankan cricket as, a, as an organization. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the issue is with Sri Lanka cricket, is as soon as uh, you know, a series like the the past India series happens. As soon as there's that little bit of success, then administrators, you know, they claim, uh, you know, success, they claim that the, okay, this system is working. Why are we winning? If why? Uh, I mean, that's that's what happens. So uh, 
like I mentioned before, all of everyone who is involved in administration, to my eyes, they have vested interests, they have agendas. So I don't think there's anyone there who needs the system to change. They don't need it. So uh, it's very hard to see something actually happening. If there are changes like really at, at the root of the problem inside the organization. Still, I think Sri Lanka will have to wait number of years before they see that that converts to success on the field. Because we've, like I told you, we've been left behind by all the top teams. So to compete consistently at that level, I think even if things are fixed now or they start fixing things now, it'll take Sri Lanka five, six, ten years to be consistently competitive at the top again. Well, I can't wait for your pieces, your depressing pieces for the next five or six years as you you follow uh, Sri Lankan cricket. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me.